Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Petronas Podcast. This is episode 66 of the Petronas Podcast, and I know I always say it is a special treat for listeners, but this is a um, the the podcast today and is a talk and presentation I gave to the Denver Association of Petroleum Landmen here in Denver, Colorado, on November 3rd, and the reviews I got were really, really good. So um, there is a ton of information sort of around the world, uh, geopolitics, U.S. economy, um, China, the macro, oil prices oil dynamics all packed into 50 minutes. So um, I really encourage listeners to look at the, you know, both listen to it, um, but also take a look, watch it on YouTube because there are slides that accompany with it. So I think you're really going to enjoy it. I I heard fantastic reviews right after I gave the talk and presentation from folks um, in the room, which the room was absolutely jam packed. You couldn't get any more people in there. And there were were a couple hundred people actually viewing it online as well. So it was super awesome. Look forward to hearing your guys' reviews um, and really Uh, glad that I can share it with you. But with that being said, that was November 3rd. Today is November 29, 2022. And boy, has the world changed in less than a month. So I hope everyone had a fantastic Thanksgiving. But we have seen oil prices just from November 3rd. And I'll timestamp this from when I did the podcast, um, when, when you'll be listening to this and from the recording, oil prices was, uh, again, re- this was 88.17 um, for WTI. 9467 for Brent and Henry Hub was just uh, shy of six bucks at 598. So the world has changed quite a bit since then. Right now, on Tuesday, November 29, 2022, we are looking at um we are looking at 7876 for WTI. We've lost nearly um we've lost nearly ten dollars. We've lost ten dollars off WTI. We've seen even lower than that. We saw seven six handles, we've seen seven five handles. Um we and and even lower, but it has moved back on talks that uh, obviously talks that OPEC um is going to cut output, which I'll get into. Um we are looking at 8388 Brent. So Brent has lost over 10 bucks, and um that's a little recovery as well because they were even worse. And we're looking, um, Henry Hub has recovered to over seven bucks. So serious moves on oil prices and several reasons for that. So I'm going to spend this introduction talking about China a little bit. And certainly in future podcasts, um, I will be talking about China in great depth. Um, we have a lot of uh, really, really good podcasts coming up. Um, so that will probably take place later in December or probably in January. But um, several things happened. So Black Friday, um, we had Black Friday spending, um, which was up. So lots of mobile spending, lots of spending on your actual phones. I would uh, caution people with that data because a lot of what we saw on Black Friday was actually a lot of buy now, pay later spending. So we did see a big surge in buy now, pay later. And we've seen that actual cert- the, the numbers were for lower cost items. So that is not a positive thing. We've also seen credit card um, spending go up, credit card debt go up. And if you have an iPhone and you notice how easy it is to buy um, things with Apple Pay on your iPhone, it's really easy. Um, And you're not the only person that it's easy for. You're not the only person that got a credit card very easily, too. And there are a lot of folks that have Apple credit cards that didn't exactly have great credit. So I would be watching the credit card space um, pretty closely. Uh, Jerome Jerome Powell, sorry, chair of the Federal Reserve, is going to speak tomorrow. He is speaking on the economy. So that will be very interesting and a nice rate height signaling um, that people were going to be looking into. I would be paying attention to, obviously, recession risk. So the market is all over the place. There was a, um, you know, last few weeks when you've seen... When you see the market go up, you know, folks are really wanting to bake in this Fed pivot. So any negative news they're getting, any any positive news they're getting on inflation or any negative news on the economy um, is is viewed by the stock market as relatively positive because they're hoping that the Fed is going to pivot. Um, that being said, I would say crypto has crashed in the last couple of weeks since this was recorded. So we've seen a crash in crypto, which means we've seen liquidity pulled out of just the market in general. Anytime that happens, same thing when we saw, you know, nickel crash on the London's Metal Exchange over the summer, or we've seen, you know, sh- uh, the stock market cr- crash. And when we, we see the stock market go back up, a lot of that's short coverings. Um, so you have to be careful with that. And all that pulls liquidity from the system and all that does impact oil. So something to pay attention to with oil is if you look at the con track the the trading on oil it is very thin um and i think that's really important to mention it's something that the saudis and opec has alluded to of these thinly traded volumes and how they don't think oil prices are are in line with fundamentals and supply and demand i, I think oil prices might be over exacerbating uh these or, or at least ahead of the curve on in sort of recession but it is um it's hard to tell if these prices are actually reflecting supply and demand given um one the recession risk that we know the economy is slowing and the seriousness of everything going on on within China and the slowdown of China, but also that we have very, very thinly traded volumes, especially from a historical perspective, 2022 is really down. So something to pay attention to. And then we have OPEC Plus meeting this weekend. So 
I, I would expect OPEC, especially with what's going on in China, I would expect OPEC to cut. Um, and because they, when we saw oil prices really down a couple days ago, a few days ago, that was because everyone was saying, hey, OPEC, um, it, there was a rumor that OPEC was going to increase output. The Saudis absolutely cleared that up and said, no, we're not increasing output. If anything, we're prepared to cut. I do think the Saudis are, they're wanting higher oil prices. They're wanting north of 90. They they're, they have been very comfortable with 100. Um, so I think we're going to see them cut. That's, that's you know, really a, a positive for obviously U.S. shale producers. Um, and I wouldn't expect even with these prices in the 70s, um, folks to get too antsy on the, on the shale side. We have a lot of folks that have um, locked in, obviously, frack fleets. I think we're going to have an unseasonally, you know, high fourth quarter, as we've seen um, in the last couple fourth quarter, in the last, you know, previous fourth quarters that people are going to want to lock, keep these frack fleets locked in on, on the, on the U S side. Um, I will be in Oxford. I'm flying out to London tomorrow. I will be in Oxford for the Oxford Institute for, in, Institute for energy studies oil day, which I will be speaking on U.S. shale, um, on this Friday. So I'll be talking about that in depth and hopefully I will be able to record that and share that with you guys. Um, and lastly, let's talk about China, uh, before you guys listen to this, this presentation. Um, okay. So Everybody is an expert on China since the 20th Party Congress. Everybody's talking about it. Not everybody's an expert. There's a lot going on within the country. So as I've talked about before and in previous podcasts, China has the zero COVID policy right now. And there was a lot of excitement in the stock market when you saw it go up the last couple of weeks. That was because people were people were reading into what China was saying is that they were putting some nuances to their dynamic COVID zero policy uh, or making it more dynamic as opposed to just the zero strict COVID zero policy. And so the last couple of years we've seen, and especially over 2022, very, very strict zero COVID policies where we saw Shanghai lockdown for nearly two months. We've seen the province of Xinjiang. Now that is the province where we've seen one to three million Uyghurs in forced labor and internment camps. Those are the this is the area that I talked about that produces solar panels and wind turbines and is made from coal and there's forced labor there. That province has actually been, Xinjiang has been on lockdown for over a hundred days. And so there's tens of millions of people in multiple cities throughout China that have been on lockdown. Now there were some different things being said about um some you know money and some um changes within the property sector to help help incentivize uh property developers actually developed the homes that they promised. Um, that was viewed by the market as pretty positive. I mean, China's the stock market's been really beaten down. So folks are pretty excited that there's some upside. So that was why we saw some upside there. And then we saw some changes, some some nuanced, uh, nuances added into the zero COVID policy, into perhaps that you know they weren't going to do as much of strict as, as mass testing. That wasn't really clear, wasn't super across the board. I think there was a lot of um, excitement and overexcitement about that. And clearly, with the they're seeing right cases. And we have to put these cases in perspective because we're talking about 40,000 cases and, you know, nearly you, you can pull up the numbers on Bloomberg, you can Google these. So let's just say 40,000 cases, like 38,000 of those are asymptomatic, which means no symptoms. So you're testing all these people. You have 1.4 billion people in your country and you've got 38,000 cases for, for, um, you know, 40,000 40, cases, 38,000 asymptomatic. So there's a lot of interesting things going on there. I think I'm on the record for saying this really isn't about COVID. But regardless of that, what happened was um, the World Cup is going on and they aired the World Cup in China. Now, a lot of folks in China, China, China people don't, Chinese people don't have access to Apple Podcasts. They don't have access to most of the stuff that we see on China on a daily basis. They don't have access to, they don't know what's going on, but they have seen the World Cup. And on the World Cup, there were people in the stands without masks. And that was a pretty big deal given the strictness of the living standards that China's living under of being on these very strict lockdowns, being stuck inside their homes. And when they're outside their homes, being tested like crazy every 48 hours, if not more, and then having to wear masks. So that, that in addition to there was a fire in the province of Xinjiang, I believe in Urumqi in the capital where they um, there was a fire and f people died within the fire because they weren't able to get out. And they attributed that to folks who were attributing that to the zero COVID and the lockdown measures where they couldn't get out of the apartment building. So that sparked protests. And so we've seen we saw a series of protests across China, which is it's uh, not I mean, it's unprecedented since the scale of, of the Tiananmen Square massacre, which was in 1989. And so there's a lot of commentary and a lot of folks talking about this and these really, really significant, you know, you, it, having protests in general at this scale and size 
it's very hard to validate because we only have we have very few reporters within within China to begin with, very few Western reporters. Um, BBC has noted that their Western reporter was actually detained and um, not treated well. I don't know if he was beaten up or, or exactly what happened to them, but that was pretty bad. Um, so <clears throat> reporters were we, we just don't have a lot of coverage to validate exactly how many people we do know this was across multiple cities across China. And it was really serious. Now, we haven't seen if you're lo- if you're following any Chinese podcasts or from China. Chinese state media are looking at Chinese media like the Global Times. They're not talking about this, naturally. Um, and they quelled this pretty quick because this happened over the weekend. This was really, really serious if you were watching any of the news on Sunday. And then by Monday, you know, China had instituted, you know, put the police out in all these places where there were protests. And they've started really checking people's phones for any foreign media app. So like a WhatsApp or um, uh, I b- believe it's a Telegram and different different apps that they're talking to people. Um, the the protest they were having was white pieces of paper that they were holding up, basically showing a sign of protest that they're, they're not saying anything in the ways that they thought they couldn't get in trouble. Very interesting is they're talking about freedom and they're talking about their rights and the rule of law. And this is a country where they don't have rule of law and the people actually don't have any rights. And that's no longer in their constitution. It has it has been removed. So um, the market interpretation, I think, has been that, you know, this is going to get better. I think if you're listening to um, the right folks, though, and analysts, this is really, really serious uh, because either these these protests sort of die off on their own, which I think the the I think China is doing uh, is is enforcing measures and and scaring people with the police tactics. Um, they have incredible control over their people. They have incredible control of their daily lives. So the ability for them to just jail people um, and and this is is pretty high. Um, and then you know if if indeed the people continue to protest, you are definitely going to see something on the scale of more of a Tiananmen style. I, I mean, there's nothing about this uh, this leadership that suggests they're any different from previous leaderships. Uh, Deng Xiaoping, who was the leader of the sort of reform and opening up that everyone likes to talk about and brag about and, and talk about the leader that, that opened up China, that was the leader that in, in 1989, when push came to shove and there were protesters in Tiananmen Square that they bulldozed over them. And then after that, there's an excellent book that I have on 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 my on my uh, thing here on China from that talks about from Mao uh, Actually, it's it's China after Mao, and it's an excellent book. I encourage folks to listen to or to to read it or listen to it. And it talks about um, the executions that it mentions that after actually took place after Tiananmen Square. So very serious stuff to just think about in the context of how this unfolds with China um, and what's going on, and really the implications for the oil market is that the oil oil really came down pretty rapidly um, as we saw. You know, we saw oil decline. We saw it come off heavily because of all the stuff going on within China. So the cases are surging for COVID. So we, um, this is literally right after everybody, the market and everybody's talking and baking in that China is going to change their policies on zero COVID. Cases are rising. We have elderly that aren't vaccinated. There are a lot of bits of information and misinformation about what exactly is going on within China with regards to zero COVID. But I would expect um, that this the protests to get quelled and I would expect that the the uh, lockdowns to most degrees to continue. Um, and if you're baking in an opening of China within the next uh, several months, w- you know, potentially next year, I think it's going to be I think it's going to be controlled if, if at any. Um, but we will watch that space really, really closely. So with that, I think I've, I've talked enough about that. Um, really hope you guys enjoy this podcast and this presentation and talk to you soon, folks. Bye. Today, I have the privilege of introducing Trisha Curtis, who is the president and CEO of Petro Nerds. Since founding Petro Nerds, Trisha has been recognized for her passion and expertise in developing strategies based on micro and macro market intelligence with on the ground intel. Ms. Curtis has a tenacious focus on solving root problems, supporting clients and organizational effectiveness, and developing and implementing growth strategies. She is a trained macroeconomist with a relentless attention to detail. Ms. Curtis has worked across a broad range of companies, both in and outside the energy sector, with a significant focus on U.S. shale, where she is seen as the leading expert and well-regarded industry speaker and commentator. Everyone, please help me welcome Trisha Curtis. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Um, so it is a pleasure to be here. I'm going to make sure I get this clicker right here before I dive into this. Um, there we go. Okay. 
get a back button. All right, it is a pleasure to be here. Um, really nice to see all of you. It's nice to have a full room. And um, this is a this is a volatile time in the market. I'm, I apologize for sort of a negative uh, negative title, um, but I thought it's it's more important to be honest uh, than to not be, in, and you will remember it. So we can all talk about energy security, and we talk about oil production and high prices, and that's great. But I think it's really about energy insecurity right now and recession and the unprecedented, I mean, absolutely unprecedented geopolitical um, and economic complexities taking place. And so we have, you know, I was given 45 minutes to cover the entire world and U.S. shale and everything will, you know, tie in a nice, neat little bow. So I'm going to talk fast. As you, if you don't know me, you'll, you'll know that I, I do talk fast. Um, fortunately, this is being recorded, so you'll be able to play it back on slow speed, and I'll, I'll release as many of these slides as I can to you. Um, major takeaways from this is a, a few different things. So what I'll do is I'm going to front load this with information. We'll talk about it. And then if I don't hit all the slides on the back end, that's totally okay. Um, and we'll, we'll keep this, I'll try to keep this as on time because I know you guys have a, a busy schedule. Um, but really big takeaways right now are, you know, the U.S. economy and, and U.S. energy policies. Um, so obviously we, I, I am very critical of the Biden administration and um, the current energy policies. We've we've never quite seen anything like this from a, an American administration in terms of domestic oil and gas production um, and some of the just lunacy in terms of policies that are coming out via Twitter. Um, but that being said, we'll get into that and we'll talk about what that um, what that means. Um, sorry, I'm just making something go away so I can see my screen. We'll talk about European and the European economy. So I think that's, you know, thinking about U.S. production is really important. We're producing 12 million barrels per day right now. We are the largest oil and gas producer in the entire world. That is not something you hear on the news. That's not something you see in Bloomberg, CNBC, Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, or the this administration. And really serious uh, to appreciate because that's really big in terms of energy security. European economy, European energy security, huge critical point into the global, what we're feeling for in terms of a global recession and global pain points, and obviously the war in Ukraine. But a lot of this was happening and building up before the war in Ukraine. Um, and it, Europe is really sort of a, you know, a something great to look at in terms of microcosm of, of what, what do aggressive green policies look like and it, when they're implemented, what are the repercussions? And that is what we see in Europe today. And it's something that we, a path that no country wants to go down. Um, and it's, it's what a lot of policies are taking place. And I really truly say this in a bipartisan fashion, which I'll show you through the data, is that the, these aggressive green policies have sort of led them into a very insecure moment in time for energy security and also opened them up to really being extremely vulnerable to Russia and really enabled Russia to have maximum leverage and put the world in the sort of situation they are in today. That was building up to that point, but it sort of allowed it to happen. Um, so that gets us to war. Obviously, we have a war going on within Europe right now. I do think there are, you know, if we think about Russia and China, there's not a lot of talk about China with regards to this war, and there should be, because China's out absolutely funding this war. So um, the trade between Russia and China is at all-time highs. Um, they have announced a, a renewed cooperation and friendship. You know, Russia took all the troops that they had on the border with China, and they moved those all um, to the border of Ukraine. This was pre-war in Ukraine. This was the buildup in sort of January of, tw of this year. And, you know, we had a lot of folks before this war in Ukraine, a lot of analysts, a lot of folks in the DC community, a lot of think tanks, a lot of folks that looked at this and just said, no, Putin's not going to invade. Um, it's just not going to happen. And because it's not rational. And it may not be rational to us or the way we were thinking, but um, I definitely thought it was going to happen. And it did happen. And the point now is that, you know, I think there hasn't been enough critical analysis of sort of where do we go from here? And what's the end game? Um, and it may not be the same end game that we're all thinking of. I think Europe and a lot of folks have thinking, we'll just sort of end this someday. And it doesn't seem like there's a takeoff point for Putin right now. So um, there are some World War II analogies with that in terms of the relationship that, that China and Russia have is very sound. Um, and it's, it's working out very well economically. Um, and they both have territorial ambitions. I think, you know, it's a little... What Russia is doing and their territorial ambitions is obviously very, very different than what um, China wants. Uh, China has very, very strategic, very, you know, spelled out, laid out territorial ambitions, especially with Taiwan. Um, and so then there's there is a bunch of green policies and ESG stuff that does really involve China. And that's that we're getting so much of our windmills when sorry, our wind turbines and our solar panels from China. Um, and so I'll get to that as well. But that's something serious to to think about and point out. So the current economic back or the current backdrop for all of this is, you know, we have 
COVID era policies and inflation. Um, and we have sort of war and then more inflation. But really, if you think about COVID and what happened and shutting down the economy, we then had this $27 trillion of global economic stimulus that we pumped into the system that has led to really severe fiscal lags leading to employment latency. We're still seeing that in the employment data. If you watched your own pal yesterday and um, the Fed, we raised rates 75 basis points and um, we are seeing a, still a very, very tight employment market. You know, the Fed is hoping for a, you know, a, a they're hoping for a mild recession. Um, they're, they're hoping to thread that needle. It's probably not gonna happen. It's never happened in history. Um, and I, of course we all want it to, but it's very different. But there is still this, this employment lag, which is really serious because you still have a lot of job openings um, and people not filling those job openings and a lot of people who just have not gone back to work. And so that fiscal lag, I think, is not something that folks really address in detail. I mean, Jerome Powell was asked about fiscal stimulus and he tried to dodge the question, but he was pretty hawkish um, overall yesterday. Um, reduce refining capacity and reduce oil and natural gas production. This is a was leading up pre-COVID and, and a lot of anti, you know, severe anti-oil and gas movement, ESG pressures, investor pressure, you know, big investor pressure to pull out dollars from the sector, which we've actually seen a lot of money obviously being pulled out of oil and gas. But COVID really put the nail in the coffin in terms of we saw massive refinery closures around the world. So one of the reasons we're seeing significant high diesel prices today in the U.S. <clears throat> and globally is because of these refinery outages in the U.S. and globally. We've lost over a million barrels in the U.S. Um, and a, a few million barrels a day abroad. So that's really, really significant. And then you just think of any everyone curbing production during COVID, and then we had to ramp it all back up. And so we just have these lags. And I think, you know, energy lags, economic lags, fiscal lags, all these things are, they take time to get in the system. So if you're sitting here and you're thinking, well, I don't feel like we're in recession, and you're probably not gonna feel like you're in recession tonight when you're at your the happy hour and you're drinking and things are great. But, you know, you probably didn't, I didn't feel like we were in, I mean, I was looking for a job in 2010, but, and we had 10% unemployment and um, it didn't feel like a recession to many people then too. And people were still going out and eating and drinking, but there's lags in that. And that 10% unemployment, by the way, came two years after the financial crisis. So everything does lag. Um, so food and energy crises, we have significant food and energy crises because partly because of obviously a huge portion of this war in Ukraine um, that is a grain belt of both Ukraine and Russia produce a lot of grain, but also natural gas is a big component of this. So when natural gas prices spiked, you know, lots of natural gas goes into fertilizer. You have poor countries that produce a lot of bread that they eat in turn, like in the Middle East and Africa, they are having low yields because they're not using fertilizer um, and they're not, they're not just not planting. And so we have low crop yields. We have high fertilizer prices. This has a nice cyclical loop with uh, then again with um, back to food pricing. So it gets really, really messy, messy. And net gas prices also impact uh, refineries as well. So all this is extremely interconnected and hugely problematic in places like Middle East and Africa, even with oil producing countries that are having massive inflation and food problems now. Um, obviously, and the war in Ukraine is provoked by the second largest um, crude oil producer. So we are the first we're largest crude oil producer, provoked by the second largest crude oil producer and supported by the number one importer of oil and gas, China. Um, that's not a coincidence. Um, China is supporting Russia in this war. Um, they have benefited significantly in terms of the economic benefit they're getting and the, all the discounted stuff that they're getting. But they have a lot of stuff cooking right now. They have a, a de severely declining economy. They have massive pain in their property sector. Um, they have these the zero COVID policy where they're just shutting down cities left, right, and center. Numbers of things going on in China that I won't be able to cover today. Um, and then you have uh, obviously wind and solar panels that we're buying from China um, and batteries. And they, they corner the market on rare earth minerals and they do all the processing for that. And those largely come from the province of Xinjiang, which is a province with forced labor, major human rights abuses, um, Uyghur Muslims in internment camps, um, all not good things. Um, and then of, of course you have this Taiwan aggression and all this ramp up with Russia and all the rhetoric um, going up. We, we also have rising interest rates and we have, um, you know, we didn't, a lot of renewables were not profitable to begin with just because they are subsidized and we're shoving them and forcing them into the grid does not mean they're profitable. Um, and we all, everybody talks about levelized cost of energy. A lot of wind and solar simply is not profitable and it is going to be less profitable now with higher interest rates because lots of this green wave and this excitement came on the back of low interest rates and uh, Biden coming into office and rejoining the Paris Climate Accords and so this renewed vigor behind it and a lot of you know tailwinds. Um, and I would lastly say just 
front loading all this is thinking about, you know, what are businesses thinking with all this information? You know, there's tons of stuff going on. I'm trying to distill it down for you. Uh, you know, one of all this, these pieces and one slide is basically, you know, an hour's worth of, of slides and, and 60 that go with it. So we're distilling this all down, but it's really important to think about risk and how businesses are assess assessing risk and how they're thinking about this. And so that's just keep that in the back of your mind and we'll hit that stuff. Um, and I'm not seeing my time. So somebody might have to just wave at me and tell me when I have like 15 minutes left and I'll have to rush. Um, so if you haven't listened to the Petronas podcast, I absolutely encourage you to do so. Um, I do not have sponsorship for this. This is, I try to be as unbiased as possible. I know I have my own biases, um, but I am extremely passionate about this business and this, this industry and energy and market intelligence and getting people information because as crazy as things are in this world right now, knowledge is power. And with that power, that's how you can change. If you are six months ahead of your peers or 12 months ahead of other businesses, you're gonna be in a better spot. So even though things may look rough, there's ways, there's gonna be a lot of opportunity as well. So oil and gas prices and the economy. Um, we are not quite to the levels of, this is you know WTI in green, natural gas prices, Henry Hub in yellow. You know We are not quite to the level we were uh, on a monthly basis that we were in 2008, but we're getting there. And it's the sustained prices. And it, they, you know, oil prices, we've lived through them, right? This whole industry, you know, we know oil prices go up and down. We know gas prices go up and down. Um, and we've sort of lived through this. We haven't really lived through high inflation and high energy prices or a particularly high oil prices. But natural gas prices are something that has concerned me all year. And that's really because, you know, we can choose to drive a little less and we do have pretty flat gasoline demand given the over the course of, of this year. Um, we can choose to drive a little less. We can choose to fly less, go on less vacations, don't see our families as much if they're, you know, at a distance. But natural gas is something that's you know, impacting your electricity bills. You don't really change your use of it. You know, you need it to heat your home. You need it to fuel, you know, turn the lights on. And um, you, I mean, you, it's basically intrinsic throughout the economy. I mean, it is, it's important, for, especially in the US economy. So natural gas prices have an impact significant on inflation and the consumer and can be very problematic for the economy. Um, we're seeing some volatility, obviously, crazy changes in pricing. I would point out that if you're just looking at WTI Brent and Nat Gas, you know, looking at the traded volumes, we really have seen traded volumes for commodities come off significantly over the course of 2022. Um, and that's, it's meaningful because we're not, Supply and demand should rule the day, right? Technicals and fundamentals should actually rule the day in pricing. And I think we, ha we have some dislocations in pricing. Um, and that's where you can see exacerbated moves. Five bucks up, five bucks down on WTI. But for NatGas, we have the Freeport LNG facility that had a fire, hasn't been back online. Um, we are exporting around 12 BCF a day right now of LNG. Um, and we have, we have record natural gas production, about 119 BCF a day of net gas production. But we've had a pretty nice fall across the US. We've We've actually had a really nice fall across um, Europe, which is why we saw European gas prices, that's Dutch TTF dollars per MMBTU. You saw that massive price spike to a hundred bucks in August that has come off a cliff. And that is because we've had unseasonably warm weather and the Europeans have announced very vocally that they have filled up their storage. So Germany and many other countries have filled up storage levels. They did that with Russian gas when Russian gas was flowing. And now they're saying they're okay for the winter and that helped drive prices down. That's great, but it's also impacted by these unseasonably warm uh, temperatures. And we really have, we're not in winter yet. I mean, we might feel a little bit tonight with some sprinkles, but we're not quite there yet. Um, so oil price volatility, um, again, I circled this down here, these traded volumes are pretty low. That's something that the Saudis have actually mentioned when they were wanting to cut barrels and they were wanting to cut output. They were talking about supply and demand not meeting reality. Um, and there is something to be said, and I, I'm not defending the Saudis here, but there is something to be said about these lower traded volumes. When we saw nickel go crazy, London Metals Exchange a few months ago, anytime there's volatility in the system and liquidity is pulled out and you have short covering, that impacts you know, commodities, that impacts oil and gas. And even, even just in the stock market in general, if there's volatility, you can see liquidity issues and then money being pulled out. And historically speaking, we've just seen a lot of less trading activity in oil and gas. COVID really put that nail in the coffin and a lot of traders had lost a ton of money. Um, but it's something really important to pay attention to because we are seeing these crazy swings. And you know, if we look at the futures price, which is a couple different lines for you, we, it, the oil curve never ends up looking like that. It never comes down. It's clean and pretty. It looks like that. It looks 
crazy and jagged and ridiculous. So when we're talking futures and strip prices, we just have to be very careful because that purple line is the futures and strip price from June. That red line is the futures and strip price from October 26th. And that yellow bit is actual reality. Um, so every time prices go down, the futures price is gonna go down. Every time prices go up, the futures price is gonna go up. It's just your vantage point of how you're seeing things today. Um, and the volumes on the back end get traded much, much thinner as well. Um, if we look at his, we're, we're at 12 million barrels a day now in production. And it's really important to emphasize that because I think a lot of folks that I speak with abroad, a lot of folks I speak with in DC and New York, they were very skeptical of us, you know, how quickly we were going to come back to, you know, our pre-COVID levels. Obviously, we're not at 13 million barrels per day, but this is as of August, 12 million barrels per day. And that is because we're just doing a lot more with less. Um, prices have been great. People are drilling. Um, but average pricing, 2000, 2007 was $44 a barrel. 2008 to 2013, $88 a barrel. And 2014, all the way through 2021, was only $58 a barrel. And still we had production climb. And yes, that was different. We burned through a lot of cash, bad decisions, et cetera. But the reality was we added a lot of oil production onto the global market. And we helped oil prices immensely in terms of the global economy. And we really helped countries like Germany, our own country, to ramp up output and have very stable energy prices, which was a huge boon for the economy. And it's something really important to think about in terms of how the economy looks um, and how oil prices look. The rig count and WTI, um, all I'm going to say with this is you guys know the rig count. I can, you can spend forever actually talking about it, even though it's pretty simplistic, but we have not come back to our pre-COVID levels. So we, um, not, not quite to the all-time highs, but we probably already hit those or, you know, I'd say 100, if not more rigs ago, because these rigs are drilling much longer laterals. We are doing a lot more with less. The efficiencies are huge. Um, so we were kind of already there and now we're flatlining and you can see from the production, I don't really know if we need more rigs and really our average, that's Permian Basin average lateral length. Um, we're north of 10,000 feet, you know, and it took us a while to get there, but I mean, that's on a nice steady ramp up. Um, and has been obviously the Delaware and or Midland in particular is well over 11,000 feet, but you can see that's where a lot of these gains are coming from. And if we look at just natural gas and what we've done on natural gas, I mean, we only have 200 rigs, just less than 200 rigs drilling for natural gas. But obviously all the oil basins have a significant amount of associated gas, nearly 20 BCF a day coming out of the Permian Basin alone, three BCF a day coming out of here, out of the DJ, you know, huge quantities. And we are producing 120 BCF a day of gas. So just to put in perspective, the world consumes and produces about 400 BCF a day. 400 billion cubic feet per day of gas is what we produce and consume globally. So we control over a quarter of that. And so when people say, could we solve this problem? 100% yes, because we do know how to produce natural gas very, very well. It's very easy. We do need pipelines. We do need the infrastructure. Those have to get built. But in terms of the molecule, it's a lot smaller and we are very good at producing it. And it doesn't just exist here. It does exist all over the world. Um, so the ability to solve this problem is solvable. Um, and it also helps on a lot of climate change initiatives and a lot of CO2 initiatives as well. Um, but that's just, it's very impressive. Okay, so we're gonna flip back to the economy, try to go through this very fast. Um, consumer sentiment is at all time lows. So we, you can see how far this goes back into the 70s. We're sort of at those 70s levels. Um, it's not good. This is your Michigan Consumer Sentiment Survey. Um, inflation and higher prices are worsening personal finances and that this is at a record high. So basically the survey is saying, you know, the reason for personal finance is worsening being inflation. Obviously, we've had bouts and periods of that. Um, 2008 was one of them. 1970s were one of them. And we're back here. And um, that is an all time high. And that's not good. Now, this gets to, you know, midterms and opinions on government policy. Obviously, we saw during COVID a big drop in opinions on government economic policy. And then we've had a real big drop um, since then, the recovery of a new administration. And then it just kind of come off a cliff uh, because we've had a, we have had a lot of fiscal stimulus, a lot of measures in Congress. And typically when you're when you have a, um, you know, when you have a mixed Congress, not much happens. And that is actually very positive for the economy because they just sort of stay out of the way. Um, they, usually everything looks better. Now, what is bad for Biden is this, and this is these record high gasoline and diesel prices, which he keeps tweeting about um, and keeps blaming the wrong people for, but he's very vocal on this. But that's the big problem here is that, you know, we have 
had massive releases from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. And that has had an impact on overall oil prices. But it hasn't impacted this nearly enough as expected because that's get diesel on top and gasoline there. And you're looking at gasoline still about four bucks and diesel at around five bucks. And that gap is just too big um, because we the economy runs on diesel. Your, your trains run on diesel. Your, uh, everything moving in, in most trucking, um, most flying. I mean, the, everything's primarily diesel except for your gasoline engine. So if you're thinking of my Amazon package getting delivered to me, that's if it's hitting a train first, that's on diesel. So Biden administration desperation, um, it seems very real right now. Um, it's very vocal. Last, uh, he just came out on Halloween and he didn't declare, he didn't say I want a windfall tax. He didn't use windfall tax, but he alluded to it. Um, and he called out the industry asking them to produce more. He's been tweeting about that yesterday and today about asking the oil and gas industry to produce more, to reduce their profits, said he's a capitalist, um, and but that you know these profits are just too high. Um, nobody seemed to care when I lost my job, I'm sure many of you did as well, that during COVID when we lost our jobs, nobody seemed to care in the oil industry about that part, um, especially on government because oil prices were low. But we have a very, and I point this out because this is very, very unique for an administration um, because we do have 12 million barrels a day of production and we are ramping up. And this is the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. You can see that that massive drop Drop down um, and not to say lots of administrations do this and I would be critical of anyone who did this but it, it, Trump administration did some some sales um, but we've never had we've actually never in history had something like this and what's happened is we basically can guarantee ourselves you know we are less secure because of this because essentially at the beginning of this administration we had about 32 days of forward cover of, of 20 we consume 20 million barrels a day each day in the US. So if you divide this out, it's about 32 days of cover that we had in our strategic petroleum reserve. Now we have just under 20 days of, of demand in our strategic petroleum reserve. And I think you know they're incentivized to probably sell this a little more um, if they wanna bring down prices. That'll probably change after midterms. Um, if you look at permit approvals on federal land, that red is the Trump administration, that blue is the Biden administration, and they have come off a cliff. They've really come down. Yes, there are still permits being approved, but not at nearly the same pace. And if you actually look at permit approvals for re-upping approvals, that was a standard practice under every administration, that is down to almost zero. Um, so they're letting those expire. And federal lease sales have gone to, I mean, there's been a little bit of federal lease sales that's green, um, that line shows you pre-administration, post-administration. Um, the canceled is red. So we've actually, everything we've sold, we've canceled. So that's all, we haven't had any federal lease sales. So when people, when people talk about, you know, I, the, the administration saying, I want you to produce more oil and gas, there's no signal to say, I actually, I'm not gonna, I want you to produce more oil and gas now because I want prices down. But I'm not, nothing in the policy say, um, produce more oil and gas because you have to have, and I, I would say this about any industry, and this is any economic or business, you have to have a stable policy framework to work with them. That includes wind, that includes solar, that includes carbon capture, that includes any business, um, you have to have that. And so the real problem here is this, that red line is US refining capacity. And you can see that that has really come off during you know, 2020, we lost a ton of refining capacity. That was because refining margins were horrible. If you listen to the Exxon earnings call, they talk about that and they actually show it in one of their charts. They show, you know, refining, the refining business is not a high fat margin business historically. It's a pretty thin margin business. And on certain times, like right now, it's great. The, re the cracks and the margins are amazing, but most of the time they're very, very thin. So that's, it's really hard when the administration comes out and says, oh, you refineries, you need to, you need to pass those profits on. I mean, it just doesn't work that way because they're buying a barrel of crude oil and then they're refining it. And then the, then the uh, convenience store is purchasing this crude oil and or they're purchasing these, these barrels and it doesn't work out exactly the way they want it to in terms of timing. So even if the administration had lowered prices a month ago, you still would have sticky prices at the pump depending upon when that you know gas station or convenience store actually bought that and when the refinery bought that crude. So it gets very messy. And you can see there is a correlation with these high prices. Um, and also oil prices are set. Part of oil prices are set by refined products. And that's something we don't hear a lot in the media space in just intelligence is that you know the US Gulf Coast, Coast is a major global refining hub, um, Rotterdam in the Netherlands and Singapore. And those are your three main refining hubs that actually tend to set prices. Um, so that's meaningful your refined products are helping keep oil prices up as well. Um, and we are the largest, I mean, we are a major powerhouse, but we are exporting 
uh, probably north now, this is uh, one month old, but north of 10 million barrels per day in terms of crude oil, natural gas, and refined product, which is really huge. Also something administration has thought about. Um, it's being talked about in DC. I don't think they can legally do it. Um, there's a lot of pushback on it, but in terms of banning exports of whether it's natu natural gas, or diesel, or, or gasoline, which would have severe dislocations in the market, um, but it is something being discussed. Um, so that's just LNG pipeline exports, 12 BCF a day. We have about 14 BCF a day of capacity right now. And I would say that we will see this ebb and flow. Um, and this does impact on, on high days. This obviously does impact our gas prices. Uh, so we'll run through this fast since we've uh, went through this already. So first day of this administration was suspending all permitting on federal land. So that would be like if I was going to any other business and I just said, okay, actually for just for two months, you know, I'm going to tell you to produce more oil aid. But for the first two months of my administration, I'm not going to. I'm going to actually revoke your permits on federal land, and then I'm going to stop all permit approvals. It was really, really painful, in, especially in places like New Mexico, um, where there is a lot of federal land and a massive amount of activity. So this was a pure suspension for two months. It was as completely political. They were trying to wrangle stuff within on the Hill. Um, and then they then they started approving permits. But still, that didn't didn't bode well for how the industry is going to swallow that. Um, day one, revoking the Keystone XL permit um, and in the name of tackling climate change. So if we think about day one of revoking this permit and when that was, this was the beginning of January of 2021. We are now almost at January 2023. So within two years, I am guarantee you we could have built this pipeline and it would be flowing and it would have added, it could add 500,000 to a million barrels a day of crude flowing into the Gulf Coast. Absolutely 100% would have helped impact oil prices. So coupled together, there's a lot of things that would have really impacted oil prices, including adding SPR, we could have really damp uh, dampened oil prices. Um, day seven was pausing all um, new oil and gas leases on public land. As I showed you on the chart, that's been very effective. Um, and the, in addition to, in addition to that, this was all uh, climate change executive order 14008. This was, this was all about decarbonizing the grid, rapidly decarbonizing the grid. We're talking by 2035, greening up the grid, which has, you know, gave a lot of incentive for a lot of wind, a lot of solar, a lot of folks on the coast to really change up their strategies and plans. And now we have folks, and not just because of this, because they were doing this prior, but now we have obviously expected blackouts uh, potentially in on, in the Northeast, who is very vulnerable with natural gas, with propane, um, who still uses a significant amount of heating oil, which is diesel, to heat their homes. And also has, um, because they don't have enough natural gas, even though they're right next to the Marcel, so they're not tied in, um, they also switch when natural gas prices are high, they've been burning diesel. Um, it's very, very messy. Um, and that's also what we've seen. We've seen that in Europe. Uh, day 30, rejoining the Paris Climate Accords. I think this is really significant. Um, it's not talked about a ton, but this whole rejoining the Paris Climate Accords and the Paris Climate Accords and, and the net zero by 2050 is really where this sort of emanated. So this, again, a lot of tailwinds, a lot of wind in everyone's sails to really push this stuff through. And that really did help incentivize a lot of operators to do the whole I, I heart net zero, jump on the bandwagon. We're all going to go to net zero by 2050. I'll tell you in a little bit why I don't think that's, that's really relevant, but... Um, Anyways, everybody did it. So back to the US and recession, we're moving around a little bit, but it'll all come together, trust me. Um, so we were in a technical recession, two consecutive quarters of negative economic growth is a recession. I don't care how political you get, that is a textbook definition. You, I get, went back in my textbook and looked it up. This recent bump we had in GDP, that was because of all of our crude oil exports and pr largely energy, if you actually look in that data of our exports, it is a one-time bump. Um, I don't expect, I wouldn't expect to see it again and it is not real in terms of the economy. It is, it is really a big portion of our exports. Now, inflation, another thing the administration and, and just politicians and folks in general uh, bragged about a couple months ago was that it was coming down. Um, if you're an economist and you look at inflation, it doesn't really work that way. It's pretty jagged. The only thing that dropped was energy prices. And so the problem was the stuff that's sticky is the stuff that why the Fed has to continue to raise rates. So the labor market is still tight. We have rock bottom unemployment rate right now. Um, because, and we have uh, labor productivity is actually down. That's not good. Um, and we have total compensation actually up. So the 
things that you don't want to see um, are, are happening. And so, you know, the work from home strategy, and I know it's, it, it works for many people. I work from home. Um, but I, as in terms in a total economy, I'm not sure every single person who's opening up their laptop every morning are, you know, always giving that full output per hour that they were necessarily. And I think we're beginning to see that in our labor productivity. Um, and that's not good for the economy. We also, as I talked about in the very beginning, so we've had this massive commodity shock, right? So this is, uh, this was put out in, in May, but it tells a really great story from the World Bank. And that's just energy price growth, fertilizer price growth, food price growth. So massive, massive run ups. And, and just keeping this back of your head and sort of the World War II analogies and, and thinking about volatility is that, you know, this impacts us, but we have a lot of energy. So even if our prices go up, we're probably going to have enough oil. Or we're probably going to have enough natural gas. In volatile places in the Middle East, they don't have that. They don't have that security in Africa. And that leads to strife, and that leads to protesting, and that leads to Arab Springs, and lots of issues and things that go with that. Um, we're seeing various things in Iran, and that was from a, a young woman um, being killed. But with these protests usually snowball, and the other issues get bolded into it, and, and they can get out of hand. Um, I'm not saying out of hand, but they can turn into different things. They become very serious. Uh, so UK inflation and electricity prices, um, we have serious inflation, not just in the US, but globally, 10% in the UK. A huge portion of this is driven by high natural gas prices, high electricity prices. And I point this out because the energy crisis actually started, and even if I don't finish half these slides, this is, the, it, this is a serious, serious takeaway. This energy crisis started last year. It did not start with the war in Ukraine. Um, it, that is very serious, and I'm not saying that it hasn't exacerbated it, but this is October 6, 2021. That was your first big mass. I mean, you're running up prices, but you had this big price spike. That was 2021. That actually started, the whole energy crisis started a year basically prior to that. It was actually the winter of 2020. We saw some unseasonably cold weather at the very end of 2020 in Asia, and that's where we saw China stockpiling and some natural gas, and we saw a very unseasonably cold spring in Europe. But we were all shut down, and nobody was really paying attention, and Europe was really hell-bent on not producing a lot of anything during COVID. I mean, they were full-on shut down. So 2020, people are staying in their homes. You have very low natural gas prices, and uh, but they're not, and they they were basically not producing a lot or increasing production in the North Sea because of COVID and, and all kinds of different things, not letting people work. And so we had just this perfect storm um, that came together. And it does have to be said, this is partly a part renewable story. And I say it's, it's everybody's story. It's, it's coal, it's natural gas, but hydro, wind, and solar all played a role. And that's because in, at this time, record volumes of renewable power generation capacity existed, all-time highs for the UK, except that time, that summer, they didn't have enough sun, and they didn't have enough rain, and they didn't have enough wind. It was a really hot summer, and so you didn't have enough. If you watched Clarkson's farm on um, Amazon Prime, he farmed this summer, and you should totally watch it because it actually is case in point. It was an extremely hot summer in 2020. So none of the solar and none of the wind and none of the hydro worked and that everybody drew down on natural gas across the entire world and it led to these massive price spikes so the point here being is that this did not start this started a while ago and this is why we have to be really really considerate about energy policies now because they have impl implications for the future um this is german inflation and electricity prices very very high inflation um, over 10% in Germany as well. And then we see the same thing with electricity prices, a little bit more pronounced. Um, they've come down. Um, power generation by fuel type in each of these places, that green line is renewables. So I'm not saying those are bad necessarily, but when they don't work, they create instability in your grid. And this, this is a problem in these times. So in both cases, we saw significant volatility. Um, the red line is gas, the black line is coal, and for um, the UK, it's a lot of solar they added and offshore wind, and for Germany, it's a ton of wind. Um, they still have a decent amount of coal power, and they have brought most of that coal-fired power back online. So for all the ambitions they've had for decarbonizing the grid, for reducing their CO2, and they're kind of a drop in the bucket in overall CO2 emissions, but for all that, because of this energy crisis and because of their aggressive green policies and because of their exposure to Russia, they've now had to ramp up. They've been burning diesel like crazy in their power stations instead of natural gas because it was cheaper. That's what drove the prices up you know, last year. And they've been um, burning coal like crazy and they're bringing back their nuclear, which they didn't want to do. Um, so that's all these policies impacting them because they weren't exactly forward thinking. Um, global economic growth downgrades. We've continued to see the IMF downgrade global economic growth. They're going to continue to do this. And 
you know, we're looking at next year for global economic growth being 2.7%. Um, the point here is that GDP correlates very strongly to oil demand, oil demand growth. So oil demand growth and GDP correlate very tightly together. I am not telling anyone that oil demand is going to fall off a cliff. I am telling you that oil demand growth is done. We, we, there's no reason why we're going to have oil demand growth. Prices can be maintained because we have lots of geopolitical volatility. But in terms of actual the economy, there's nothing positive in the global macroeconomic picture to say, I'm going to be using more oil. Just it's not, it doesn't exist. Um, and if anyone tells you it does, there, I need to see the data because it just, there isn't. Um, Chinese home prices in the property sector, I could spend an hours telling you about China and the nuances going on there. But the property sector has been, is about a third of their economy, if not more. And that has been declining since 2019, actually, and a really rapid decline. Big changes in Xi Jinping's economic policy and how he's taking it forward, um, but is not positive for economic growth. They have had significant um, COVID shutdowns, would have, which have obviously impacted oil demand as well. Um, you have IEA and OPEC saying basically the same thing. They use these, these uh, you know, extreme words. They say deteriorating macroeconomic circumstances or deteriorating economy. Um, so that word deteriorating keeps coming up. Um, OPEC plus did their big cut. Um, if you noticed, you probably can't see it, but on here, um, Saudi Arabia and Russia happen to be the exact same number of 526,000 barrels per day that they're both gonna cut. So this was definitely Saudi and OPEC sort of throwing Russia a bone and saying, hey, you know, we're in this together. Um, I think production in, in Russia was going to decline anyway. It's been pretty resilient. Um, but they definitely are working on this together. Um, the Russian war in Ukraine, the only reason I put this up, and I did update this this morning, this is a map from February 24th when the Russian invasion happened. This is a map from uh, yesterday, or a couple of days, yeah, yesterday, of there's been a lot of changes in between that time period of what's controlled by Russia, what's controlled by Ukraine, back and forth. The point is, this has been going on nearly a year, and all I heard when this first started was, it's going to be over soon. And there was no, it's going to be over soon, there's no sort of easy way out of this. So the point I'm making is it's going to be entrenched, and the ramifications for this, bad ramifications obviously for Ukraine um, and for, for Europe, but, you know, Russia's doing a, a, they're doing a what they want to do, which is keep Europe at their knees and keep them completely and completely vulnerable and very economic in economic pain. Um, a lot of people talk about this, and I like to put the numbers to it because I just I, it drives me crazy when I see percentages and not actual data points. So if you want to know how the crude flows into into Europe, there's three main conduits, and that dotted line is Nord Stream two. Nord Stream one was how it largely came into Germany. That's been, both those pipelines have been sabotaged. I do believe that those pipelines were sabotaged by the Russians, making a very profound statement that one, you're not gonna get the, the gas back. Two, we're not done with the war in Ukraine. And three, we're not actually done with the whole thing in, in this whole process. So it's, it's a statement more than anything. Um, and it's a statement that you need the, the gas more than we need uh, you to buy it from us. Um, but we also get gas that comes into Turkey, that's still flowing. And we also get gas that comes into Ukraine. Interesting that they didn't mess with the Ukraine thing early on. I believe that's coming. So if you see these flows come down, that, that bit that's left here is those conduits I'm talking about. And so right now, Russia is attacking a significant amount of Ukrainian uh, power. And so we're, I think Ukraine is without over 30% of the country does not have power. Um, they're telling people not to come back for the winter. And we, I think you can expect that to continue. So if I'm bringing home the point that electricity and energy matters, it matters a lot. And so you've really brought all these countries sort of to their knees, and that's that's pretty significant. Russian oil production has actually been really resilient, um, impressively resilient. So it's come off a little bit, um, but in terms of these forecasts keep getting revised sort of upward in terms of north of 10 million barrels per day. They're going to come down a little bit, um, but not the way the International Energy Agency sort of forecasted production to come off a cliff and us to lose all this production. So it's been really resilient and it just sort of moves around the world. You know, yes, we're not taking the 500,000 barrels a day that we were into California, but the, it just moves around. So we see um, the differential has, has was at $1.35 a barrel. So if you're India and China and you're buying this crude like crazy, you're getting huge discount. If we look at oil production um, in OPEC, it's about 30 million barrels a day. Um, so very impressive. Just to point out, this is the record highs for Saudi Arabia. So this is the first time ever that Saudi Arabia will clear an annual production figure of 10 million barrels a day. So just perspective of as 
you know, we've seen politicians beg the Saudis to increase their output. We are producing 12 million barrels per day. They are producing 10.9 and they're going to be dropping production because they want to maintain prices higher, but they have never consistently produces over 10 million barrels per day. Uh, we've also never asked them to. The global economy has never needed the US, Russia, and Saudi to all produce 12 million barrels a day. Um, and so we have to be a little bit careful of supply and demand thinking about that. Um, that being said, the global rig count has also recovered largely. I mean, that's us, that's the US here. And Middle East rig count hasn't completely recovered, but you can see overall, we're getting back to our pre-COVID levels. Um, so production is gonna be coming with that. So inflation is very high. We went through this, um, it's sticky. We have core inflation being very sticky. We have um, both food and shelter. If we, if we look at core inflation, it's very high. Things like shelter are very high. So when we saw the Fed yesterday say that, hey, I think the market was looking for them to pivot. I heard a ton of commentary very late last night on um, housing and how housing was actually not gonna be that dampened. It, that's pretty hard to say that housing is not gonna be dampened because if, if inflation remains high on shelter, that means that, and you have 7% interest rates and it's gonna keep going up for, for mortgage rates, nobody's buying a house, nobody's selling a house. That incentivizes people to rent. Rental prices will remain high. That will keep core CPE, core inflation high. That means the Fed will have to continue to raise rates. These are all things the Fed does not want. These are all things why the Fed should have been raising rates over a year ago, but they didn't. And these are all really sticky, problematic things that, um, are not quite are not quite teased out by most economists. I think you're seeing talk on on TV places. Electricity prices are way up. Um, that was really damning. Okay, I'm haven't got through half my slides. That's okay. Um, U.S. total household debt is over 16 trillion. One trillion was added in 2021 alone. So that's very significant in terms of you know where do people look. Credit card balances are rising. You always hear the consumer looks so great. They don't. They look much better than they did in 2008. But Credit card debt's rising. U.S. household savings rate is come off massively. Um, people are spending this. Um, this is a big takeaway slide. I know it's messy, but if you take away nothing from this presentation, I think this is a pretty valuable money slide. Um, this is uh, inflation, interest rates, Fed funds rate, your interest rate, and unemployment. And if you look at the 1980s, in May of 1980, you had inflation at 14.7 percent. You in January of 1981, you had the interest rates that had to go all the way up to 19.1 percent. Not saying they're going to go that high, just saying that that's what happened. And then in November of 1982, two years later, you had 10.8 percent unemployment. Everything lags, um, and it's really important to see that. We have not seen high oil prices and high inflation like this. Um, basically ever. We did have high oil prices in the 70s, but you can see that red line is inflation. Now we have high oil prices and high inflation. So I call it high oil prices and high everything prices. And nobody in this room has really experienced that. And that's, it's very, very serious in terms of, you know, filling up your tank, going to the gas pump. Mortgage rates, rates are north of 7%. Um, that is a big deal in terms of the speed and just the ability to qualify to buy, but also buying. So you're just not seeing things sell. Home sentiment and home builds are way down. That does impact oil demand, because when you're building a home, you are constructing, you're using diesel and everything, and that's gonna start eating into oil demand. Um, overall, global oil demand and prices, if we look back in previous recessions, we only lost about over a million barrels a day in 20, 2008, but we led that. The US was the biggest driver in lost demand in that, in that recession, and that was two and a half million barrels a day we lost in 2008. Um, it was a very, very painful recession, and we it, that's just something to consider two and a half million barrels a day is not the end of the world by the way in terms of overall demand but it's pretty significant in a 20 million barrel a day demand market um and we do see housing rising and falling with you it works out on almost every data point of this is u.s home prices and oil demand and they do uh rise and fall together so i talked about china and russia and i think i'll i'm gonna go two minutes over and cut into my uh q a time but so this is the unfor you know the it's not forbidden. Basically, this new friendship you heard about between China and Russia at the beginning of this year um, it was actually before the war in Ukraine. They said basically there was no forbidden areas of cooperation. Very important to point out because that means that that's China and Russia talking about Ukraine and China and Russia talking about Taiwan. We've seen China really push the Taiwan rhetoric over the course of this year. They came out with a white paper right after Nancy Pelosi's visit. Um, I put this map up here because this is from the Global Times, which is a Chinese media source, and they call this the nine dash line, but they basically, that, that thing that they say right there, not even a bit left behind, that's the territorial ambitions. That's the whole thing that they want. Um, so it's not just about Taiwan. Um, the Chinese exports to Russia and Chinese imports from Russia, essentially they work in lockstep. They're all time highs. So China imports a ton from Russia, Russia imports a ton from China. It's worked out really well for the two of them. Russia's fuel exports to the EU, 
So this is the money slide too. The money is not is in oil. It is not in natural gas. So that red line is the oil revenue that Russia has gotten from, from Europe. That hasn't changed really since the war in Ukraine, a little bit, but not much. And that orange line is the, is the natural gas revenue, which has changed, but again, not that much. So it's a fraction of what the oil revenue is. And if you want to know the volumes, it's total volumes is their exposure to Russia was over six, was over 17 billion cubic feet per day. Massive. This is a huge energy security no-no. You just don't have, you can't have 20 BCF a day exposure to a single country that just you are not even close to being politically aligned with. Um, and that is why we have to be very careful on buying wind, solar, batteries, every rare earth mineral, everything from China, because we're putting ourselves in the same position. But this is European gas production and consumption. Another big takeaway slide. 55 BCF a day of consumption, 20 BCF a day of production. They have the production. They have chosen not to produce it because of their green policies. And that has done nothing for them in terms of actual reduce. Not producing your own energy does not reduce your CO2 emissions. It exports it to someone else to produce it. Um, the IEA, and I probably will close with this um, because I don't have enough time to go in the rest, but this is the IEA's latest uh, thing that they put out in the World Energy Outlook. Um, I'll just front load this with saying that in 2020, the IEA, um, and they became an advocacy organization at this point. They used to be an organization that gave really good data on oil and gas. But in, in 2020, they said the IEA has made its own position clear since the scale of the COVID-19 crisis began to emerge. We have been leading the goals, uh, we have been leading the calls to put clean energy at the heart of the economic response to ensure a sustainable recovery. So they were pushing clean energy as advocating for it during COVID, which is very different than saying this is sound policies that you need to be doing. Um, and then most recently they said that this energy crisis is about the war in Ukraine and it wasn't caused by clean energy. Um, and so clean energy was definitely a component, which they need to admit that. Natural gas, coal, all of it was a component. But basically they're just saying, if we have more clean energy, we won't have any of these problems. And then the numbers they call for are insane. And that is why the, I, the net zero stuff, it, you just really do have to throw it out, out with the bathwater because when you see these net zero, that 2030, this is not net zero by the way, this is just the sort of stated policy scenario. 93 million barrels a day demand by 2030. That's a 7 million barrel a day drop um, that would have to happen between now and 2030. I can, it, it's not going to happen. We will not drop demand by that much. That's how much demand we lost during COVID. It's not gonna happen. You would have to shut the global economy and the US economy down, won't happen. 2050, we have to take that all the way to, 50, we have to have basically oil demand by 2050 from today's levels. And then if you go really aggressive and you go to the net zero, in, by 2030, you have, to, you have to have demand for oil 25%, 25 million barrels per day. And that is just, it is not going to happen unless you crater the economy. And then every, if you crater the economy and you actually lower oil prices, every, I mean, the Saudis and the Russians will be burning it. They will be, you will be using in your homes. I mean, you will have higher emissions than you've ever seen before because it will be really cheap and everyone's gonna be using it. Um, I think I'm probably going to close with that because um, I can keep talking about this stuff if you want me to get into um, U.S. production, and I have some data points on that. And I think, lastly, I'm just going to say, when we talk about Chinese power generation, we're talking about 5,000, um, we're talking about 5,000 terawatt hours of just coal, and we're talking about 1,000 terawatt hours being added last year alone. Um, and that's pretty significant because that's more than all of our coal-fired power generation in the U.S. that they added in one year. Gas is only 3% of their grid, um, and they do have a lot of renewables, but they build out those renewables in tandem with coal. Um, and if you look at the just, so when we're aggressively, you know, killing our own energy security by shutting down our coal-fired power plants, particularly in the state, um, we c you just have to look at the map and see that Chinese coal-fired power plants, you have 198 in construction, you have over 3,000 operating. That is doesn't include the 121 that are announced, the 106 that are permitted, and the 122 that are pre-permitted. Their coal industry is going nowhere. It is at absolute all-time highs. This is for energy security for them. This is probably gearing up for a more you know, advantageous um, and uh, more war time scenario for them, but they are at 400 million tons um, that they are producing, which is an all-time high. And that comes from a lot of that coal is produced in the province of Xinjiang, but those coal-fired power plants in the province of Xinjiang, which is where you have the human rights abuses and the forced labor, they that is where this almost all of the world's solar panels come from. And you can it is documented that does come from forced labor. It does come from Uyghur Muslims in these internment camps of where this, this comes from coal and it comes from forced labor in the province of Nijiang. And I've already told you they corner the market on that. So with that, I'm going to close and just go into Q&A. So thank you.